Good morning, Dan Passar and the rest of the world. And if you're watching us on the replay, good afternoon. I think it's good morning in a lot of places. Yes. But good afternoon in many places as well. How are you, Mike? I'm good. Still on the first cup. Still only on the first. I'm already on my third, man. I can tell. Yes, I've been up at five. I've been, yeah, look at I that. I can tell. Fluffy you're little, hair. Uh, you're a little too... Today is Friday. It is. And like every Friday comes... It doesn't mean much. Yes, it's the end of the week for us to come live with the shows. And today we bring you some very special guests. Yes, very special guests. Howard and Michelle Hall, those of the IMAX movies, which I think you've got a, a few of those ones that you can hey, pop Don't into. rush oh, it, man. Bring on. it in. Come on. Come I want on. to listen to your speech impediment in the morning. My come speech on. impediment in the morning <laughs> and in the afternoon <laughs> and in the evening. <laughs> All right. Let's bring me the, them up. They have been in doing IMAX movies, doing natural history movies, doing all kinds of... Uh, Stuff with the underwater world, putting on a TV, movies, cinema, IMAX, all over the place. All right. Uh, since the 70s. We're having a technical five. problem uh -oh. already. I need to put you back on, man. Uh-oh. Yes. I don't know. The monitor just decided to disappear for a moment. Excellent. That's but all right. I'm sure that I can keep you talking. are able to keep talking. I can keep right? talking. I've been filming all over the world. Their movies have been seen all over the world. They are still active and doing a lot of, a lot of new projects as well. they got their next IMAX probably coming out next year. So very well-known names in the industry, uh, very talented people. Uh, I don't see anything on my screen other than than our logo. Take What's going camera, on, man. Luke? Take it easy. Come on. Keep rumbling. <laughs> <laughs> Opening, a, waking up at five. Here we go. Oh, I'm back. They're, they're going to come. So we there have got go. a, a very that. entertaining, insightful, thoughtful uh interview that we did uh, with them last week yes it's, only one time yeah <laughs> uh just a little bit over an hour we talk about a lot of stuff there how they first got started into the business uh and even all the way up to what they're doing today so it's a mm. it's a really uh and look who we have already in the chat room uh, michelle she's have? over there hi she michelle there? good morning and howard probably is next to her and then uh, we have adri hi and anna hi anna the lodge how are you scott Gatsy is there. Gatsy's awake this yeah, early? Yeah, it's quite early. He probably didn't go to sleep yet. No. Yes. Gatsy goes to bed early and he wakes up and Larissa, at 4, he says. Hello, Eric. Good to see you there. And uh, come on. Keep going. Oh, Bring no, no, up. no, no. I want, well, like, I want to see these. Intro. I want to see the, the photos this, now that you've, you've fixed you fixed it. You got it on there? Yeah, yeah. All they're right. all there. So you can see some of the ones that they've worked on, Island of the Sharks, IMAX Under the Sea, 3D. We talk about and we show some photos of the IMAX 3D camera that they, they use underwater. This thing is a beast, 1,300 pounds. Um, and you will get into some very interesting discussion about how they have to transport that thing all over the world, getting in and out of the water, even just getting it onto the boat. So very good insight there. And I thought that we had a big camera. Yeah, we have a very <laughs> small camera. Yeah. It's actually interesting to see the progression of the size of the cameras throughout the years. Much smaller now, much easier. Out of these four, which one is your favorite? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, probably Journey to the South Pacific because that one's got a Roger Ampad in there. Uh -huh. All right, so why don't we get... I need a little bit of time to, to close all these windows. Yes. Sir. And here we go. Oh, I see Google Earth. Yeah, I brought up for uh, later after the show. I'm going to show you something special on Google Earth. And uh, what is going to happen during the weekend before we jump uh, right before into Before the, the weekend, video? we've got a few more uh, interesting interviews going on today. We've got another interview we'll do tonight. So next week, who do we have on our lineup next week? We've got a lot of people. We've got Sarah Lewis from the, the Mancha Foundation here in... Um, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. We've got Gutsy, who's watching now. Yeah, he's coming up next week as well. Censor. Who else have we got next week? Did we censor Gutsy yet? With oh no, no, and no. we yet. haven't censored Gutsy. All Gutsy, right. we might have to censor you. You're yeah. listening out there, Gutsy. Yes. Okay. Let's uh, jump straight into uh, the yes, interview we've got because Pepe Arcos as well and actually. Pepe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pepe is coming up too. It's, it's going to be a great week with uh, fantastic underwater photographers yep. and a great conservationist, Sarah exactly. Lewis, coming up. But now, without any further ado, why don't we jump straight into the interview 
and here we go. Hello, Howard. Hello, Michelle. How are you guys? We're great. Hi, Mike Doing and Luca. Very well, thank you. Great to see you. We just uh, introduced you guys off camera to to introduce who you are, but uh, just wanted to talk about you know you guys have been now involved in natural history filmmaking since uh, I guess the nineteen seventies, and want to get a little you know just a little background about how you started into it in the seventies, and then when the two of you uh, met and became both of, both of you became full time into the production uh, scene, I guess we call it. Well, <laughs> Howard got involved in filmmaking uh, long before I did. I followed in his footsteps after I left a almost two decade career working as a nurse. So I left that in January of 1991. And by then our, our film production company was well established. And um, Howard, how did all that come to be? When I was in college, I um, paid for my college education by teaching scuba diving. I had a job at a dive shop in San Diego called The Diving Locker, which was owned by Chuck Nicklin. And Chuck at the time is, and still is a very famous underwater cameraman. And he not only made uh, a good living from the dive shop, which was a very popular dive shop in San Diego, but he also did assignments all over the world doing uh, uh, feature films like James Bond films and documentary films and all kinds of, of things. And uh, his lifestyle was very inspiring. And uh, uh, there was a lot of young photographers that worked at the diving locker at the time. Lee Snyderman worked at the diving locker. Uh, Steve Early, you may not have heard of. Flip Nicklin, who's a well, very well-known uh, whale photographer. Uh, and, and many others worked at the diving locker in those days. And uh, uh, I, you know, wanted to do the same thing. So I started taking underwater still photographs and writing articles for dive magazines and eventually articles for natural history magazines. And uh, I got to where I could start paying for my film, eventually pay for actually the purchase of some of my camera gear. And, uh, and it just kind of went from there. So and you, you guys have uh, like a, a f basically a full production house right? It's well, we, we, we are a, a film production company and a stock footage library. Uh, we've always <clears throat> tried to keep our company small. We don't want to have an office or employees or anything big. When we're in production, we obviously have to have a lot of help and we hire people as we need them, but we only hire people for a production and they only stay employed for that production. And once the production's over, we're we're back to working out of our home. So, uh, but yes, we, we uh, continue to make our living making films and selling stock footage. We've, we've had the goal, managed to, to maintain the goal of not having employees other than ourselves, uh, two, two person company and working at home. Mm -mm. And actually, this is uh, also, let's say, in uh, the, the Hollywood world, every time they make a film, this is the, the way that it happens, right? It's like they hire that's, that's you right. and then uh, you need to put together all the pieces to make uh, the production happening. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Of course, a lot of people would like to have, you know, you kind of imagine it's great to have a big production company and you know, employees and so forth. But we've never really wanted to do that. And, and very, very often big films that are made in Hollywood, even IMAX films are typically incorporated as corporations that last only the length of the production. So uh, each of the, the major films we've made were you know, their own company for a short time. And then when the film was released, the company is dissolved. Interesting, I didn't know that. And you've started, I guess, with, with, in the filmmaking with, with the 16 millimeter. Uh, we've got some pictures here that, that we're going to show as we talk about this. But we've, we've gone, you've gone from 16 millimeter to, to IMAX to the IMAX 3D and, and all the way through now to, to REDS now. But the, the, I guess the evolution from, from going to film and, and coming to now, the, the technology, has that made life a lot easier, say, shooting, you know, a red camera with eight, uh, a red camera with, you know, multiple media on it compared to a three minutes that you get on a, an IMAX? Well, it's certainly easier. 
uh, and working with a, a, a camera that weighs 30 pounds in an underwater housing as opposed to a, an IMAX 70 millimeter camera that weighs 250 pounds and only runs for three minutes. It's, it's obviously much easier to work with a digital camera, but the disadvantage to that is that it's easy for everybody, not just me. And when we were making IMAX movies with uh, a 250 pound camera system, which was what we used for our 2D IMAX films, uh, you know, that's very difficult to operate and it's very expensive to operate. And because of that, I had relatively little competition. There wasn't a lot of people out there making IMAX films underwater. Uh, I had to build my own housing for the IMAX uh, camera because there really wasn't any acceptable housings that existed. And because of that, I, you know, I had the only good housing in town. So uh, we, we made a substantial number of the IMAX films that were made in those days. Uh, when we started doing IMAX 3D, it was even more the case. The, IMAX 3D camera system uh, weighs 1,250 pounds out of the water. And it's a very intimidating piece of gear to use. Again, runs only for three minutes before you need to change film. And because of that, there's not a lot of people that attempted to make films with it. Um, so I didn't have really any competition. Once cameras became digital and these systems became really small, then you know, lots of people could go out and make an IMAX film. And we're seeing, you know, more IMAX films being made and, and I definitely have more competition. So I, I liked working with the big, cumbersome, awkward, inefficient, <laughs> ridiculous uh, IMAX films. I, I enjoyed that. Myself and my crew were very, very good at making things happen with those cameras. And uh, that was part of the success, success of those films. Uh, the kind of film we can make now with digital is a, a far better film uh, because it's just so much easier to do and we can take the camera so many more places that we couldn't before. Right. But, um, I, 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 in many ways, miss using the really big cameras. Well, we've got a, we've got a short one of your films here that shows you with uh, behind the scenes with the IMAX. We've got the, the one with the, in South Australia with, with the Great Whites. We're going to pop this up here to have a look at it, but just showing the whole, how big it is and, and, and two people behind it. This whole series just shows, like I said, the back behind the scenes. How, how does that whole process go with it? You've got such a large camera, a large housing, you've got to get it from California to all around the world. Uh, the whole process behind that must be an incredible mm. uh, event. How do you guys get that, uh, organize yourselves to do such a thing? Thanks to well, the producer. <laughs> enorm enormously complicated. And uh, the first six months of production when we're making an IMAX 3D film is just planning and organizing the logistics. And the logistics are, are incredibly complicated. We would ship 8,000 pounds of equipment uh, to various locations around the world. And I think you have a photo there yeah. that shows uh, all the equipment laid out on the deck before we get it onto boat. Go ahead. Right, yeah, yeah. we got that laid out there. And I'm thinking now you are on a dock and I'm thinking like putting it on a plane and <laughs> all the logistics behind must be right. In the, in the case of shooting in, in Papua New Guinea, we had to have a charter aircraft fly the gear in. There was no other way to get the gear to the location. So we had a charter aircraft and you have to plan every step of the, of the, of the way because you have a, the, the smallest part of the camera housing, which the rear bell was 800 pounds. Wow. So, you know, just picking it up and putting it on the boat, you need to plan for how you're going to do that ahead of time before you go to New Guinea, before you get to the dock, before you try, try to get the boat to the dock. So, uh, all those steps had to be planned ahead. And, and we, one of, the, one of the, the funny things that happened was that when we shot in Papua New Guinea, we looked at the, the whole logistical plan. Okay, we're gonna put all the equipment in a shipping container. It's all gonna be shipped to Papua New Guinea. It's, when we get it to Papua New Guinea, we're gonna put it on a, a, um, a charter aircraft and fly it to Walendi, which is where we started our expedition. Uh, when we get the aircraft to the airport, okay, we need, to get the gear out of the airplane. Okay, you need to mm -hmm. think about that because 
you know, how are you going to do that? So we, we had to make sure they had a forklift that was going to be able to, you know, get the housing on the pallet, pull it out of the aircraft, put it on a truck. Then we needed to be able to take the truck to the dock. It had to be able to, a dock that you could drive the truck out to and, the, and either reach the camera housing with a crane from the boat or have a crane on the dock that could put the housing on the boat. So all those things had to be planned out ahead of time. And if you drop the ball at any one place, you're kind of stuck. And, and Michelle completely screwed up. We went to the <laughs> beginning to ask a really important question I about had, the, about I had the all my check. I had all my checklists that I would go through for every location. And included on that checklist was, do is there a forklift at the airport? And I asked that. And I was told, oh, yes, ma'am, there is a forklift at the airport. Fabulous. Went on to the next question. We get there, get off the plane. I wish I'd sent you a picture at the airport, more like just this little hut and airstrip. And I said, where's the forklift? Oh, ma'am, it's over there. And they pointed to this pile of heap of weeds. Oh, there were no. Weeds growing all over the, they had a forklift. My failure was I didn't say, do you have a functional forklift? Do you have one that runs? Does it have gas in it? Can it move? Will it move our equipment? So yeah, yeah I, I messed up. So we had a bit of an adventure getting the, the camera housing out of the, the aircraft and onto the truck, but we managed to do it. Mm. Wow. Yeah, we have a picture of the camera housing by the surface and it looks huge with all of you around it. And so, uh, into how many pieces would you disassemble that for traveling? Uh, the, the housing broke down into three pieces. The front part, which is, you know, like the, the dome port. We actually had a dome port for the system, but we never really used it. A flat port. Uh, and then the rear bell, which kind of covers the back of the housing. And then there's a center section where the camera is mounted and all the electronics are attached and all the cabling and all that stuff. So three three parts of the housing. And that was designed between an effort be with you as well as the IMAX engineers? That's right. Uh, when we did our first IMAX 3D film, uh, which was in 1994, uh, uh, it was called Into the Deep. It was the first underwater IMAX 3D film made. And uh, it was actually the, the, the second uh, IMAX 3D film under, underwater or above water that was made. The housing, the camera was brand new, had never been used. And uh, we consulted with IMAX engineers and, uh, and designed the camera housing. The IMAX engineers actually contracted to have the housing built, but it was essentially our design. Myself and Bob Cranston uh, did a lot of that work. Uh, and so it was, it was you know, it was, it was our idea, <laughs> and so when there was problems with the housing, it was you know our fault. Yeah, but, yeah. but the housing actually worked extremely well, considering how big it was. And that must have been different for you guys then. If you you've gone from you know using sixteen millimeter or or uh, I, yeah from using sixteen millimeter, moving over towards the IMAX, where you're doing the production, the pre-production. Your, you know, your scripting and all that stuff for a 16 millimeter film, and now all of a sudden you have to change it and evolve into doing it on something that's based with only three minutes of film. Uh, how did that change your ideas for scripting, and how did that change your ideas for how you would film? Preparation. It must have been a, a real big learning, maybe not a real big learning curve, but a bit of a an evolve evolution in your learning curve when you change to to IMAX. Well, one of the funny stories is when we were making Into the Deep, uh, uh, we were coming back to the boat with the, the big camera, getting ready to hoist it up on the, the boat for a film change. And one of the crew got on the underwater communication system and said, there's a blue whale just on the other side of the kelp bed. And, uh, and my response was, so? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the idea of trying to film a blue whale with this camera system was just, it just ridiculous. You know, absolutely no possible way. So, uh, what the, the subjects that we chose and the behaviors that we chose were things that we felt were possible with a camera that was the size of a refrigerator. One of the things that I did with all the 
uh, 3D films that we made and even the 2D films that we made is we always made a television version first. So I made a film in 1990 called Seasons of the Sea. Uh, that was a PBS film, also a BBC production. And I reshot those sequences, all the ones that were easy and practical to do with the IMAX 3D camera when we made Into the Deep. It was the same sequences. So I had had the benefit of being able to practice shooting those things before I took the big camera in the water. I knew exactly what was possible, what was likely, and, uh, and I knew what sequences to not even bother, uh, bother attempting to do. That makes sense. And so when you, when you guys are, are going into this whole uh, idea of, of creating a production as a team, you must have then different, you know, Howard, you're probably thinking about the scripting and, and what you're wanting to shoot. And Michelle, what, what happens behind the scenes with the production stuff? How, how do you guys organize yourselves like that? Well, we've uh, worked together successfully for a few decades now. And I think that part of that success is because um, our talents mesh very well. We, the things that I'm good at, the things that I like to do are typically things that Howard is not good at or things that he doesn't like to do. So we rarely run into conflict over who's gonna do what. Um, I do the behind the scenes production uh, planning, organizing with for all the shipping and the uh, contracts with our various crew members and airplane reservations and on and on and on permits. We so many permits are required. And, uh, and we, when we did uh, <laughs> under the C three D, uh, we had to acquire sixty different permits. Wow. Well, she did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so and and car rentals and communicating with the crew and. Uh, Communicating oh, with the crew and <laughs> communicating with the crew right. because yeah. they're typically all of our crew were boys and boys don't always follow directions really well. <laughs> they just want to go diving, but you know what? If you want to get paid and if you want to get yeah. there, you got to sign these papers and get me this information. So I would deal with those kinds of things and Howard would deal with what are we going to film and what's the script going to be and and we would discuss about which would be the best boat to charter mm -hmm. once we decided on which location to go to. Mm -hmm. And um, he would deal with getting the equipment um, built if things needed to be built and the lights and all of that kind of grunt work. And, and like you were saying um, before, like you, you go to this uh, remote place and um, let's say, for instance, for a pulley close by uh, the airplane, mm -hmm. you know, you would think like, OK, do you have it? Yes. but for them to let's say for anyone like receiving you like it must have been like uh, it's hard to give them maybe an idea of uh, what uh, you you are bringing in as a production because even if uh, let's say they had big uh, let's say production coming most of the time we're not camera about that size so for, for somebody it's very difficult to to understand so my question here is you probably send many photos uh, uh michelle and you make them understanding what you bring in there and so on and many questions and the people there they always answer like over here they would say like yeah sure no problem sure no problem yeah, exactly. no problem no problema. yeah so we always felt that it was important to uh hire to charter boats and people who were familiar with dive locations um if we could we would have our list of howard would have his list of things that he wanted to film and if people didn't know where to find them then you're just swimming around and it's pointless so uh, our go-to resource were dive charter boats mm -hmm. which also meant that we typically had to charter a fair amount ahead of time because the good boats would be booked up yeah. but we would get that squared away and then we would typically go to scout uh, the boat. We would we want to meet with them in person, show them photos of what the camera looked like. We would talk about what modifications needed to be made to the boat. Most some of the boats that we chartered already had cranes on board, but yes. not all of them. So we would meet with them and talk about what would be the best kind of crane. And again, we're uh, talking for um, most importantly in this regard with the 3D camera system that weighed 1,250, 1,300 pounds. 
because you can't just pick that up and no. dump it over the side. You need a crane to get it in and out of the water. Hmm. Um, so we would scout location, not only to give them an idea of what we wanted to film and where we might, specific reefs that we might go to do that, but also to um, sort out the logistics for the boat itself. We would have a crew of usually 12 people and um, I would need to, if we hadn't been on the boat before, or even if we had to re-familiarize myself with the way the boat was set up so that we could sort out who was going to be in which cabins and where would we store this 8,000 pounds of equipment while we were on board for a month. And that, yeah, sorry, to finish this. And what was the, the, the reaction once you were arriving there with all the equipment? Everybody would say, ah, now I understand why there were all those questions and preparation. Usually people had a pretty good idea of what was coming because we, we, we were very careful about preparing them and, and giving, you know, discussing each of the details, how big the davit or crane had to be. And the fact that when you pick the camera up, you ha we had to have a four foot by eight foot area on the deck where the camera could be put and it had to be that big so the camera could be assembled and disassembled, you know, and it had to be someplace you could reach because once you pick the camera up and put it on the deck, you can't, you can't lift it. Right. So, you know, there's all kinds of details like that that we went over with the boat owners and the crews uh, in great detail. And as Michelle said, we scouted our locations ahead of time, went out on the boats ahead of time, did some sport diving with them, spent a lot of time kind of preparing preparing them for what was coming. And I don't think, uh, I think everybody was amazed when they saw the camera, but they were also prepared. So they knew, it was, you know, something big was coming. Right. Well, I think, I think a picture, I think a picture is uh, photos and we would take pictures and I actually assembled a notebook to show them, to try to give them an idea. And they would say, okay, yes, this is way more complicated than we thought when we first talked on the phone or emailed, but okay, thank you. But I have to say that when we actually showed up at the dock with all the stuff, most of the time, the crew was just, what? <laughs> we knew you told us, but really? Really? And then there was the time that we were in Mexico and we got everything loaded onto the boat and got word that a Chabasco or hurricane was coming through and we had to unload everything because we had to go get, and then I had to go get motel rooms for all the crew because there was this hurricane and the, we couldn't go out to sea to do the work. So we just, just, I mean, five minutes had yeah. gotten everything loaded on the boat and they said, oh, you need to get off because <laughs> too dangerous and out of here. So that's always fun. <laughs> Not. Right. But a lot of times when the, when the boat owners and the crew saw all the boxes, because it's one thing to say, okay, we have 8,000 pounds of gear, but when you see all that stuff unpacked in boxes on the deck, it's like, how's that all going to fit on the boat? On the boat, yeah. And I, and I would just, I would just tell, you know, the, the crew members, that it, it all will find its place. We, I, we will find a place for it. A lot of the boxes will stay in the trucks, you know, but you know, they, they sometimes, sometimes, got a little bit panicky but all that stuff would eventually go away that was that was the fun challenge of it all yeah that'd be a major challenge and that yeah. that idea because the the housing is so big it reminds me of the when you were you did the with the sharks in Rangaroa and that's a drift dive and you've got that massive camera that takes two people but also you need to get it, you know, going through a, a, a very fast moving channel, you have to drop with the boat in the right place and you have to get to an area where you come up. You're obviously not doing that with a, with a tender boat. Uh, you must have the actual main boat dropping you in and dropping you out uh, or picking you up. Uh, Was this the that? camera that they were uh, using in Rangiro? The no, yellow one? no, the big one. Oh, the, the, yeah. the IMAX? Yeah. yeah. It was, it was it was a smaller one, the, the uh, 2D camera, which out of the water weighs 250 pounds. And when we worked in Rangiroa, we chartered the Undersea Hunter and bought oh. it from Costa Rica all the way to Rangiroa wow. to support the film. Okay. We used it in Fiji. So, I mean, a pretty expensive operation to, to charter the boat and bring it all the way from Costa Rica. So we did that, and we had a, a special davit system built for one of their skiffs so that we could pick that camera up and put it on the skiff okay. and uh, 
one of the skiffs was dedicated just for the camera and the people maintaining the camera. And then there was another skiff just for the, the divers and a third one for the launch and recovery crew. And uh, uh, we would take that skiff out and the, and the divers out to the very mouth of the, can of the, of the uh, Rangiroa Pass and drop, you know, drop us in, you know, and we, we would descend it. And we did the same dive over and over again, which was great fun. We'd go to 230 feet, and Mike, you know the cave that's there at the mouth of the, of the pass. We would film there, try to capture a few scenes, and we're on rebreathers, so we had unlimited amounts of time we could spend, but obviously we racked up a lot of decompression. And then we would drift into the, the pass and shoot the sharks as we're moving through the pass and eventually move to the right side of the pass where there was a cave at about 40 feet where we could decompress and then, you know, make the, the run all the, all the way into the shallows. And uh, we did that dive many times. And just, you know, we had, uh, it was really a lot of fun to do that. Yeah, that current in that channel can, can be a, a, a bad one, even with just a, with a GoPro. So trying to do that with a large camera would be fun. Yeah, it was, it, well, that was part of the story was, you know, we wanted to talk about how hard it was to, to do those things. And the film that we made was a, called Coral Reef Adventure, which featured Michelle and me and our crew. So we were being filmed uh, doing these things. And uh, uh, when we started talking about uh, the making the film, Greg McGilvery was the director of that film. He said he wanted to call it Coral Reef Adventure. And, and then he said, well, what, what can we do, you know? And, I, you know, it's, it's very common for underwater productions to do things with sharks and make it scary and, you know, dangerous moray eels coming out, you know, and <laughs> it, it's kind of standard. We, and I didn't want to do that. If it was going to be called Coral Reef Adventure, I wanted it to be a real adventure. And the things that we tried to do, I wanted them to be challenging. So diving in the Rangiwa Pass was one of those things. We also did a series of trimix dives uh, in Fiji and also in French Polynesia to well over 100 meters. And that was pretty challenging. That's a, that's a challenging enough dive just on its own. But we not only made those dives, but we took two IMAX cameras down to 350, 370 feet and did underwater film work at, at those depths, which just the idea of it scared the bejesus out of me and all my crew. And because it was, you know, scary, yeah. uh, the idea of doing it was scary. It really was an adventure. It was a completely legitimate adventure to do those dives and to take those risks, manage them and, and bring back the film. And um, Howard, so here is, comes a question. I've been diving uh, now f uh, for quite a while, not as much as you did, uh, but uh, more than uh, 20 years. And I know what it takes, you know, to go deep, um, probably more than, uh, let's say, a beginner diver, because a beginner diver doesn't really know what he's doing when he's going down there, you know. So so you, you mentioned this, uh, that it was scary, it was frightening, it was challenging. So how did you prepare yourself with your mindset? That... Well, we, we did a lot of things to prepare. Uh, myself, Bob Cranston, Mark Thurlow, Dave Forsythe were our rebreather crew members, all of which were planned to, to make these dives to over 100 meters. Uh, and even though we had many hours, in fact, probably more hours than almost anybody else on rebreathers, uh, we didn't have any experience doing Trimix. So the first thing we did is we took Trimix courses and we took them from Joe Duturi and, uh, and Richard Pyle, and who are you know, very famous rebreather divers and Trimix divers. Uh, we hired Richard to be part of the, the film and the story became Richard attempting to capture a new species of fish you know, below 100, 100 meters. And um, so we did all that. We did some, a lot of our work up Trimix dives in, um, in Hawaii with Richard and Joe. Uh, and then we went out and, and learned a lot from working with Richard because he knew how to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then developed some of our own techniques for, for doing the Trimix dives and, and uh, managed to survive it. <laughs> we made a few mistakes along the way, but we did manage to survive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One. <laughs> very strong uh, mental uh, 
condition for sure to make uh, such a uh, it, such a dive. It it was especially difficult because when we go down with the IMAC camera, we would often spend sometimes as much as two hours setting up a shot, figuring, you know, and, and a shot that we knew existed because we'd been down to the dive site before, we knew what to expect. Non climate dive. Uh, this is just, you know, regular, you know, shallow water diving. But when we went to 100 meters, we only had 30 minutes to do that. So we had huge time pressures. In addition to that, we didn't know it was going to be down there. We, we were making dives to some place that usually nobody had ever been. We didn't know what we were going to find down there. So we had to be nimble enough to be able to shoot what we saw when we got down there. And we had to get it done in 30 minutes. And so the, the time pressures were really enormous. And we just felt constantly trying to get things done as fast as possible. And I, I remember... Uh, talking to some of the astronauts that, that worked at, at NASA. We did some filming at the neutral buoyancy tank some years ago. And talking to these guys who worked outside the space shuttle, walking in space, and they would not know really what it was like because they had no time to actually look up and look around. They were so busy, so task loaded, that they just didn't have time to look around. And I, I felt the same sort of thing when I was down below 100 meters with IMAX camera, I was so busy that when a, the dive was done, was, I, I had a hard time even remembering what I saw. Mm -hmm. so, and were you successful? Or is he able to capture the fish? Rich Pyle discovered five new species of fish that we actually filmed him capturing uh, you know, at, at as deep as 370 feet. And uh, it, it, was, it was completely successful. Because I guess you guys must do, uh, not common because you put a lot of effort into the into the, um, the research and planning but every now and again you must have issues like I know you told me a story in the past at Cocos Island when you did the Island of the Sharks that conditions weren't really what you expected uh, how do you cope with something like that when you get to a location you've done all the prep work and now all of a sudden uh, nature doesn't cooperate how do you cope with that Drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been what I would do. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of a lot of a uh, lot to that answer, actually. Uh, when we make a film, I write a very detailed script, uh, which includes all the narration. I mean, the the whole film is is on paper, including the narration before we shoot anything. Of course, the animals don't don't read, and they don't, you know, they don't follow the script. So things change and we have to be prepared for things changing. And uh, so that, that's, that's, that's kind of part of it is being totally prepared with the script and then being, once you're down there, trying to capture those things that are on the script, but not forcing it if the animals do something different, recognizing that that's what the animals do and then incorporating that into the story. So at the end of each expedition, we would rewrite the script based on what we actually captured versus what was, is actually in the in the film or in the script. The other thing is that we would always incorporate a huge amount of time uh, to make the film. We would, our films were always at least 100 days of diving. Uh, IMAX films were more like 130 days of diving. That spread out over a vast period of time. We yeah, would go out for about a month at a time. Okay. Exactly. So, so we could afford to have a whole ex three week expedition where we didn't get anything and still be able to make the film. So, you know, that great amount of time we'd go down, we would try the, the, the kinds of things that are in the script. And if the animals start to do something else, you know, I would be up in the, in the evenings rewriting and you know, changing the sequences so that uh, what the animals actually did was reflected in the script. And then there was also those things that just happened, things that you didn't know about, animal behaviors that you didn't know existed. And we were always watching for those. Michelle would always be out scouting for some something that she'd see and we might be working on you know some goby in a you know or jawfish in a in a hole and we'll get a, a call from michelle on her comm that there's an octopus doing you know some kind of courtship display or something that we didn't even know we didn't put it in the script because we didn't know about it and so about 20 percent of the films ended up being sequences that we didn't know about but we just captured and then incorporated those into the story uh you know after the fact so being flexible, as Howard is, was saying, is um, 
really important. And for instance, Mike, you brought up Island of the Sharks. We went out to Cocos, had this whole production plan and wanted to make a film about the sharks, hammerhead sharks at Cocos Island. And we got there for our first expedition in January of 97. And um, it was El Nino, La Nina. And there, <laughs> the water was really, really warm and the hammerheads were not there. And so we thought, well, we'll just shoot some other things. And we went home after a month and then we went back a month later and we had 66 diving days from January till August of that year without seeing a single hammerhead. Wow. wow. <laughs> we considered at one point pulling the plug and just coming back, regrouping and going back uh, a year or two later or just seeing what would happen. And then the light bulb went on that, wait a minute, there's another story here. This was one of the biggest meteorological events of the decade or more. And there was a story that could be told. So um, <laughs> after many nights of Howard pacing back and forth in our cabin and wearing a, a hole in the carpet, um, we brainstormed that we could do this, just tell a different story. And so it reshaped because we we're flexible enough to, um, to do that and to think outside the box. And we think that in fact, in the end, it turned out to be an even better film than it might've been had that not happened. And because we did, I think we did five expeditions to Cocos yes. Island over a period of 18 months, the first three of which we didn't see a single hammerhead shark, uh, but eventually they, they came back and we were still in production when that happened. We were uh -huh. able to actually not only capture the, the coral reef bleaching out and completely dying there uh, and all the animals that were affected by the, this crazy El Nino event, but then when the water cooled down and the animals came back, we were there for that. So by having enough time in, in the production budget, uh, that helped really make the film successful. And if all of that hadn't happened, we might not have gotten, we might not have had the uh, brainstorm, the thought, or I'll give the credit to Howard to have the thought to capture one of your, Mike, one of your favorite things. Yeah, exactly. We've, we've just popped it up here. I, I don't know why, for some reason, this one has stood out in my mind for 20 years. I've always said, I, I want to do, I, and I've never done a proper I, underwater time lapse like this, but... The, the idea of it, what, what brought the idea on to, to create this time lapse and how does it work with an IMAX camera to create a time lapse uh, over well, such I a had long period? With, I'd experimented with underwater time lapse uh, and shot underwater time lapse scenes for my first television film, Seasons of the Sea, and uh, shot a sequence of bat stars off the coast of San Diego, which are sort of similar to the cushion stars at Cocos Island. So I knew that there was a lot of really interesting anthropomorphic behavior that goes on with starfish when you capture them in time lapse. So I, I knew that. Now, to capture it in IMAX, we had to change, we had to build special equipment. The, uh, the, it's a mechanical device and it has a thousand feet of film in it. And when we, we had to attach a device called an intervalometer, which had a big motor and a shaft that went into the camera and then turned the, the mechanism one frame at a time. So you'd set it up so that every five seconds or every three seconds, the device would come on, the motor would go Rump, and just change the, the film by one frame. And we'd set the camera up on the uh, tripod with the lights and our crew would stand around uh, on the bottom for you know two or three hours at a time watching the camera shoot one frame at a time. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's how we captured it. And I knew that those, those cushion studs would be interesting. And there was a, uh, that one part of the film that I really liked also where the, the starfish come down the side of this rock and then they tumble down over this, this little cliff, right. which I knew that they would do. And, uh, and then they have to invert themselves and they run away. And I, I had done the same sort of thing with starfish off the California coast. So I knew that that, was, that, was like, that would likely work. Uh, in time lapse with the IMAX camera. How, how many hours did it take to, to take, let's say, every view that we see here uh, in this film? 
each view was about two two hours of being underwater. Two hours. So, so and then that would the, the that that includes setting everything up and you know organizing yeah. everything, and then the camera would. I think we had it set for one frame every three seconds. Okay. So in order to capture a thirty-second scene, we needed to run the the camera for about a, a little over an hour. Cool. Amazing. And during the time, how do you cope with that? You need to stay by <laughs> the camera, and you have a book to read. Or? <laughs> hey, you know when we're when we're waiting for that stuff to happen, we're we're diving. You know, we're <laughs> down there with our things. rebreathers on. And we, we made very, very long dives with the, the rebreathers and, and we just really enjoyed that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just great fun to be down there, not have to worry about how much air you have left and being able to stay as long as you want to and yeah. be able to work with the gear. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's always fun for me. There's, there's been some dives where they were too long and a little bit too tedious, but for the most part, we just, we loved the diving and, and we were never really bored. Mm -mm. Because rebreathers must have really changed the whole thing for you, being able to, because for people who are not divers out there, you're going to typically get about an hour on a scuba tank, but on rebreathers, you guys could be down there for hours. Um, was that just something that someone asked you to do at one point to get trained on it for a specific film, or did you know, we need more time underwater, we need to train ourselves in the rebreathers? Um, how did the rebreather start? the electrolung and it showed a, a diver swimming with this you know strange looking backpack on with a spear gun and it advertised you can go to 1000 feet and stay for six hours oh and I went, <laughs> 1000 feet well, it, 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 the ad did not say you you could do that but you can't come back alive but, <laughs> but there was absolutely no impediment to going down to a thousand feet and staying there for six hours, you, you, the decompression would have killed you. But, but you know, I just, just that just blew my mind, and I always wanted that device. And of course, back in those days, uh, the electrolung was put on the market. A, a lot of people died, and they took the, the device off the market, and it wasn't available. And then when we started doing uh, television films, we wanted to do a film on the Sea of Cortez, and. Back in those days, the Sea of Cortez was a very, very alive uh, environment. And the best place in the world we thought to film hammerhead sharks was the El Bajo Seamount off La Paz. And back in those days, there was lots of hammerheads on that seamount. And you could see them from the surface. And we had done films where we, we free dive down to capture shots of the schools. But we always wondered what was going on down on the bottom below those schools. And I wanted to, I wanted a rebreather so I could go down there. Uh, the hammerhead sharks were always spooked if you exhaled bubbles, so going down with scuba gear didn't work. Uh, we wanted rebreathers so that we could be quiet and and see what was going on. So my partner uh, Bob Cranston, who worked for a company called Diving Unlimited at the time, uh, he had contacts with the U.S. military, and we were able to lease two rebreathers from BioMarine. At, back in those days, you couldn't buy one. They were considered strategic technology in the United States. Uh, there wasn't any commercial rebreathers after the electrolung disappeared. And so we were able to lease these two rebreathers for $500 a day each, <laughs> and which was a lot of money at the time. And uh, we took those to the Sea Cortez, taught ourselves to use them. There was no instruction. Wow. Uh, the, the guy that, that gave, us, gave them to us insisted we do a pool dive uh, what was that in Pittsburgh? Back in Pittsburgh, he was not a certified diver, so it was not you know the best choice of instructors. And we read the U.S. Navy manual on the device, made a dive in the pool, and then we went to the Sea of Cortez. And especially after all the electrolung history, we were um, pretty paranoid, and uh, even more paranoid because they didn't work very well. The electrons were constantly failing and glitching, and but. Uh, we, we managed to figure out how to dive the system manually when the, the system failed and uh, we took back up with us and we were able to get down underneath those schools on the El Bajo Seamount and uh, got absolutely a magical footage at the time. Uh, how deep was that uh, seamount? Uh, the seamount, the, the top is about 60 feet. We were working typically around 130 feet. 
So we would be down at 130 feet for an hour or more and then do the decompression coming back up. But with the rebreather, that's just not a problem. So our sorry, I think this is funny because um, you had to do a pool dive and then maybe the guy asked you like, oh, what do you guys want to use this for? Ah, just to go in the sea down <laughs> at 160 <laughs> feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. But he, he had he had he had no clue. So yeah. it was like, um, anyway. and I guess you've been using them ever since. Uh, it, it, would you say the rebreather allows you to to interact with um, marine life better than you would ever get with scuba? Well, y yeah. It, it, this is a, a bit of a controversial topic because I kind of go against the conventional wisdom here. People. Most people that start using rebreathers imagine that they're going to be down there and they're going to, because they're not exhaling bubbles, they're going to be so quiet that the animals don't know they're there and you're able to get close to the animals and you're able to get special interactions with the animals. And that's true to some extent. It certainly is true with hammerhead sharks. We were able to get down below the schools of hammerheads. You couldn't do that with, with open circuit because the bubbles did scare them. Uh, things like garden eels. You could get very close to garden eels and film great behaviors because you didn't exhale bubbles. But it became apparent to me that the real value in having the rebreather was being able to go down and stay as long as we needed to to get the job done. We could stay as long as we wanted to. Uh, when we were diving with the rebreather, I wouldn't even look at my decompression computer until the dive was done. And I'd look at it and go, okay, well, I have 45 minutes of decompression to do, you know, and I'd call the surface and tell them to have lunch ready in an hour. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 we, it was never the constant you know, pressure of running out of gas right. and being able to stay down until you got the job done, be able to work with the animals for hours if necessary, that, that made a huge difference in our film projects, uh, much more so than the lack of bubbles. Right. Could you open up the um, the great white shark one? Yeah. We're just going to open up the great white shark uh, from Australia here. Uh, and again, that that shows the, the rebreathers and things. But it also shows um, we're not I don't think we'll be able to play the, the audio here. But the nice thing with the audio is that it's got the communication between you guys. So surface support with Michelle on the boat, uh, Howard and the team down underwater. How does that work with between you guys, you know, having teams, you've got, you know, camera teams, filming teams, people on the boat. How do you guys uh, communicate and get everything, you know, get your ducks in a row while, while you're trying to do a, a shoot like this? Well, the, the people at Ocean Technology System were, Systems were really helpful with us with our underwater communication gear. Not only did they... Uh, uh, provide underwater communication gear for many of our film productions, but they helped us design and build special equipment. And for diving in British Columbia, you know, putting a full face mask on is, is, is great because it helps keep your face warm. But uh, for a lot of diving, full, full face masks are a bit awkward and, and difficult. So we decided we would try to build a device called what we called a mumble comm which was a microphone that was embedded in the mouthpiece with a push to talk button. And then you just kept the mouthpiece in your mouth and talked around it. And so it sort of sounded like this, <laughs> and you have to be really careful and speak real slowly <laughs> to try to get people to understand what you're saying, because if you talk too fast, you can't understand a word. Right. right. It, it doesn't sound anywhere near that good. <laughs> See, you're very good, <laughs> though, Michelle. When, when we were when we're on the bottom, and I'm working with my my film crew with Peter, or Mark, or Bob, you know, we're, we're talking to each other, but we're talking about something that's right in front of us, so it's in context with what we're doing. So it, it would be completely impossible for people on the boat to understand what we're saying because it was just mumbling. But because we're down there looking at whatever we're working with, it all kind of makes sense. Then when we would need uh, the camera service, we need to send the camera up for a film change or a lens change or a, a different filter or whatever. I would get on the comm, call Michelle, because she was the only one that could really understand what we were saying. And 
she, we would then ask for our launch and recovery crew to come and get the camera. The rebreather crew would stay on the bottom and they would just amass decompression, <laughs> you know, a lot of it sometimes. And we couldn't just swim the camera up and hand it to the guys on the boat. You know, so we had a, a team that was open circuit. They would come down, grab the camera and take it up without any worry of decompression. Uh, they would change the, the filters and lenses and film, and then they would bring it back down and we would just stay underwater. And, uh, uh, but Michelle spent a lot of her time on the surface trying to decipher what we were saying. <laughs> yeah. Need a d so d could, dentistry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, a l getting back, Mike, you were talking about the various sort of teams that we had. Right. Or one of you was asking about that. So we had um, we had our underwater um, uh, rebreather crew, which was four people. We had two or three of the launch and recovery team. We had our two dedicated assistant camera people, camera men. They were both men um, who were not divers when they started working with us, but they were so excited being out on the boat day after day, week after week, that they eventually wanted to learn how to dive. Oh, that's good. We're meant to stay dry and be on the boat to uh, change the camera system out when it came back up. And then we would also hire uh, local knowledge. So we had the boat crew, as I said, we would hire boats that were very knowledgeable of the area, but we also would hire a scientist or a marine biologist scientist to come along with us to um, help us maintain our honesty in what we were filming. So uh, Howard with his vast background um, had an understanding and a knowledge of what he wanted to film, but we wanted to be sure that we were getting it right. So we would also hire either additional local knowledge or a scientist, marine biologist to come along with us to uh, help us find subjects, but also be sure that what he was filming was in fact for true what happens behavior wise and not something that mm -hmm. sort of got manufactured. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Very much makes sense. The, you know, going on, like, again, watching this, the, the, the white shark one, um, that one, who's more nervous when you've got something like that? You're, you're, you're great whites out of the cage. Are you more nervous on the boat thinking that they're down, stay, are down underwater outside of the cage? Or is it a little bit nerve wracking being with great white sharks outside of the cage or? Well, yeah, from my perspective, I had made those dives, not while we were in production because I needed to be on the boat to manage the topside logistics but I had made the cage dives. I'd been down there. So I sort of had a sense of what might be going on, um, but I couldn't see, we didn't have monitors from the surface down to the bottom. So I couldn't see what was going on. I could only try to listen. And there was the occasion that when I heard words that I won't repeat here, that I think <laughs> what the hell is happening. I can't wait till they come back and they can tell me what was going on just then. Um, so Howard had his own uh, encounters that made him nervous or not. Yes, there is one here actually that he comes. It looks like he's sneaking yeah. up from from behind. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a, a great little part of that particular video because it's kind of funny. Uh, it, at the time, it was just one of those things where uh, my safety diver missed seeing that shark. He was looking the other way when it came, and then I turned around and, and saw it and and. I think it was Mark Thurlow, whose job it was to make sure that one doesn't catch me by surprise, was a bit apologetic about having missed it. But I, I don't think there was really any significant chance that one of those sharks was going to bite any of us. And certainly if it came for us, it was going to have to eat about 1,300 pounds of aluminum before yeah. it got to us. So Here we go. Here we, we go. Were, we were, right yeah. from behind. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was on the surface and I heard... I never saw that one coming. I thought, <laughs> what the heck is going on? But uh, we had uh, the, the, sorry, look, you wanted to ask something? And just, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you on that because it's so funny because I see like the, the shark coming from behind and our going probably with lots of beeping in that, like, whoa, like that. 
And then yeah. the safety divers, once the shark is clear, he still goes after it with the stick, you know, like, <laughs> kind of saying, oh, I need to do my job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it goes. <laughs> You see that he's going towards yeah. the shark. It's quite clear from the camera. Like, oh yes, I go now. <laughs> it's incredible. We had uh, the underwater comms were really um, important throughout the whole production, but were so important for that great white shark dive because we could communicate. Howard would the cage would go down. He would get down to the bottom. He would let me know over the comm that he was ready for the camera to be sent down. And unlike the other locations where we dived and we had the launch and recovery crew that would bring the camera down to him, we we didn't want divers free swimming in the water mm. column uh, with great white sharks swimming around. So mm. we uh, developed a pulley system where the camera would get put into the water uh, using the crane on the boat and then a pulley system to bring it down. And then Howard could, once it got down there, he could let me know on the surface, okay, okay, we've got the camera, or whatever it was that he would say. And so I could try to envision what was happening. Cool, so, so incredible. And we can see here the images of the camera coming from above down and really yeah. down and, and exactly. you hold to it. Yeah. It, it yeah. looks uh, perfectly neutral buoyant, uh, the, the IMAX we, camera. Uh, it, it had those uh, a lot of bolt holes on the sides of the camera that we allowed us to put weights on to trim the camera so that depending on what lens or what system we're using we could get the trim just exactly right and even different bodies of water have different densities and we would find the camera housing behaved mm -hmm. a little bit differently in tropical water as opposed to temperate water so we had all these places we could bolt on the weights in the case of South Australia, we wanted the camera to be a little bit positively buoyant in case something happened and it would, you know, float and somebody in a skiff could go out and get it. Yes. Right. So, so we had all the weights on the bottom uh, in the cage and we would bring the camera down by rope. And then once it got to the bottom, we'd put the weights on the top and, mm. and that trimmed the camera out to where it was neutrally buoyant. But it was, it, it, did, it didn't weigh an ounce underwater. Nice. Perfectly. Nice. It still had all that mass. So once it started to move, it didn't want to stop. It was right. very awkward to operate, but uh, it didn't have any weight. And also looks like uh, there is a very uh, efficient quick mount uh, light system. Did you develop that? Yeah, we developed the, the, the whole lighting system. We built the mounts for the lights. They're actually just standard uh, above water uh, seal beam lamps for cinematography that we built underwater fixtures for. Of course, today everybody uses LED lights, but back in those days, we had no LED lights and everything was incandescent light. And the only way you get enough power to produce enough light to, to get a, a decent shot was to send the power down by a cable. So we had a 220 volt cable that we you know, operated the lights by. Gotcha. And you were saying earlier, uh, you mentioned, you know, the big camera they were showing here, not something that you would want to try shooting a blue whale when you had someone say, hey, we got a blue whale here. But what we do have is we have some incredible footage uh, that you've shot of a blue uh, or a series of blue whales. Uh, could you describe a little bit the encounters with that? Because this is some of the best, I mean, behavioral footage, rare footage that you're Eva, ever going to see. In the underwater world for me. <laughs> <laughs> We, when we were making our, our first uh, television film in 1990, Seasons of the Sea, uh, we, it was all about Southern California marine life. And for a period of about, about 10 days, I was getting phone calls from fishermen saying there was whales at the Coronado Islands, which is about 10, 15 miles from San Diego, uh, whales out there feeding. And the first time you hear something like that, you go, well, you know, when was that? This is a day before yesterday. You know, well gone now you know but after I heard this three times I realized well it's been going on for 10 days and I keep thinking well it's gone now but it isn't gone and I've been blowing it and so uh, Bob Cranston and I jumped in uh, the boat we went out there for an afternoon we ended up staying for four days <laughs> and uh, it was a spectacular bloom of krill and blue whales feeding on it I had never seen a blue whale before. And even though I live in California and have been diving in California my entire life, uh, 
this was an, an totally new thing. I'd never seen a blue whale, certainly never seen one feeding before. And here we are making a film and we were underwater capturing scenes of blue whales feeding on krill, which was just uh, totally incredible. Uh, and we got a lot of really great shots. Of course, that was all in 16 millimeter film, which was you know standard definition video and the resolution is terrible. And since 1990, I've been going out every season trying to capture those scenes again. And some, some years there's uh, no blue whales, some years there's no krill. You know, uh, it, it's taken all, since 1990 to re recreate some of those scenes. Wow. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because everything has to be just perfect in or, or if we be able to capture underwater scenes of blue whales feeding, you have to have krill, you know, because that's what the, the, the whales eat. Uh, if the krill is down on the bottom, it's down 300 feet or more, and you obviously can't film them down there. So if the krill is down, you just see the whales on the surface, they go, they dive, and then they come up, and you really can't get any, any useful shots. Um, so you need squid to actually feed on the krill and push the krill up to the surface. And the, the, the squid actually forced it to the surface, caused the krill to form these big krill balls, and then the blue whales will come through and, and eat those krill balls. Wow. And, and uh, you, you, you water do... visibility is terrible. So even, yeah. though got, even though you've got krill and you've got squid, most of the time when it happens, you don't have enough visibility to even capture a scene. So uh, you need krill, you need squid, you need the blue whales, you need calm water because it's an open ocean, and you need it to be exceptionally clear. And once those things come together, come together you can get you can get some shots but it is it is very difficult uh it once it's happening it's not so particularly difficult but it's just very difficult to get those conditions you can't make it happen uh every year we go out most years we don't get anything uh in 2015 we got most of the shots that you see in that video okay. it was just a spectacularly good year uh, last year we didn't see a single blue whale so you know you just wow. take your chances and you need to be a really good free diver. Oh, oh you yeah, took this one a free diving? It was all, all done free diving. Wow. Yeah. Can you be that stable free diving? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to stay down that long. Look at that. How could you, like, how, that's at least, um, I think, I would say maybe a, a good minute dive where you have to go down, hold it there. And whale coming to you, and then pan shot until the tail goes by. Well, it's yeah, it's not easy. When I'm getting a shot like that, it's it's kind of weird because I the, the that signal tells me I feel like I need to breathe. Kind of goes away when I'm seeing something that great in front of the camera. So, uh, <laughs> scary. Thank, thanks for I, all I would, of us. That's happened to you, would, Howard. So we can all enjoy I these beautiful prefer. images. <laughs> I would much prefer to use scuba, and I've done some really great uh, whale photography using scuba. Mm -mm. But most of the time, it's just you can't move quickly enough, and you can't right. orient to where the animals are uh, because you're wearing something, and and you can't see them. Uh, when you're on the surface, you can see where they are, where they're coming, and then you can make the dive at the right moment. It's harder to do that with scuba. Uh, these things are 100 feet long. Yeah, the water has to be extremely clear. Amazing. Yeah, and uh, what lens were you using during this, during this uh, sequence? Uh, though all that footage was shot with either a 10 to 17 Tokina lens, uh, and then later when the when Canon made an 8 to 15 uh, full frame fisheye, uh, we ended up using that. It wasn't a full frame fisheye; it was a uh, 8 to 15 fisheye lens, which on my red camera was full frame. Yeah. And what uh, red camera do you did you use for this uh, sequence? All of them. Yeah, <laughs> all of them. From okay. Some some of those uh, blue whale shots were done with a red one, which is the first 4K red camera that came out. Yeah. Uh, later, I had a red Epic, which was uh, capable of 6K. Although I I seldom shot it at 6K, mostly at 5K. Uh, and then now we're shooting with a red helium, which does 8K. So I think there's one shot in that sequence that was done with the 8K camera. And that, that leads to a, actually a, a good question about now with IMAX, you are no, your, your latest uh, IMAX 
film that will come out next year. That's all now being shot on red as opposed to being shot on the big IMAX camera. Much, must make your life so much easier, at least logistically uh, traveling and everything, at least somewhat with gear amounts. But how is it, <clears throat> excuse me, how is it shooting now without having to do the big beast, um, but still being able to produce super high quality uh, footage um, in a much more compact way? Easier life well, it, or harder life? It's, it's obviously easier. You know, it's, it's much easier. The IMAX camera would run for three minutes and we'd have to send it to the surface. For a film change, it would take 20 minutes. And even the 2D, 2D camera system weighed 250 pounds out of the water. It's hard to swim with. Uh, it's very hard to see through the viewfinder of an IMAX camera. Uh, it's a very dark image, hard to see through. Uh, the, the digital is just almost infinitely easier. I have to say, though, that I, I miss the challenge of working with the big gear. Uh, I also miss the budgets. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when it was all done in 70 millimeter film, it really justified a lot of money to go out and make a film. And organizations like our, our last two IMAX films were made with, uh, with Warner Brothers. And you know, a, a documentary film for approximately $8 million was peanuts to them. So, <laughs> but with digital, you can go out and make a film for far less than that. And, um, uh, but then the disadvantage is you're competing with all the other great young underwater cameramen out there that can go out and buy one of these cameras because they're not that expensive. Yeah, and that they stole all your tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, that's what they're there yeah, for. Because uh, I think we all uh, got inspired by you watching, uh, you know, your uh, cinematography out there and try to repeat that. I want to get that. Let's go and get that. <laughs> we can do it here in the macro world, we try. Yeah, yeah I mean, pe people often think that I'm going to be upset by the fact that, you know, the BBC will go out and recreate a sequence that I shot in 1990. I mean, that happens all the time. But, you know, that's the way the world is, you know, you, you see something done and you re you try to go out and do a better job of it and the things that i i did you know i i copied a lot of my techniques by walking watching how people made films in africa and how they created sequences and you know all terrestrial stuff above water stuff uh and then i i looked at how uh, people did underwater lighting people like al giddings and jacques Cousteau and and so you know it's it's all you know i copied as as much as i possibly could mm -hmm. and so i don't resent any of it and um there, there is um there is this uh, beautiful uh, uh ro romantic uh, story behind it you know the the filming the documentary the storytelling of the underwater world and like uh, for anyone that uh, is uh, aspiring uh, to become an underwater cinematographer should go oh, back and, and watch uh, season of the sea from uh, 1990 that uh, today would still make it as a modern piece of underwater cinematography with all that uh, beautiful storytelling underwater. So for the p viewers that are watching now and inspiring for uh, uh, becoming a cinematographer underwater, definitely that's, it's a must watch film for all of them. But here I come to, I want to ask you something today to the more modern area that we are seeing kind of looked like becoming a little bit more uh, superficial in, uh, you know, with the world of YouTube and like this, everybody's got, you know, like uh, the camera and has the capability to create some beautiful images, even with a GoPro, you know, like uh, nowadays. But then they put it together like in this very fast uh, cut uh, short films of one, two minutes. What's your take on those kind of uh, modern uh, uh, films from the YouTube area? Well, I, I think YouTube is a, a, a spectacular tool and it's a great way for young filmmakers to, to get started. And I, I know people that make their living uh, making YouTube videos and there's a lot of people out there doing that. So uh, it's, it's a, in many cases, it's a different style. Uh, the films that I made tend not to have people in them. Uh, they're all about animal behavior. That's what I like to do. Uh, and the way I tell stories 
typically would be longer cuts than YouTube stuff. Uh, I like the camera to be held still. I like to put the camera on a tripod much of the time. Uh, but that's just a style thing. And it's, there's no right or wrong to the way other people make films. Uh, there's no right way. It's, it, 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 the film is, is done right if it's, people watch it and like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all different kinds of, of ways of doing it. And it's probably best to try to develop your own style instead of emulating my style or somebody else's style to you know, learn how to do those things, learn how to, to do the, that kind of cinematography. And then after you've learned it, slowly develop your own style. Uh, and hopefully you'll come up with something entirely new. And what, what, what's on the table for you guys now? Your next project, you've got, um, you've got Secrets of the Sea coming up uh, next year, but you're also doing a lot more, I think you're doing a lot more travel um, that's not basically production based. What are you guys sort of plans over the next few years in the way of filming, in the way of, you know, just relaxing kind of thing? stepping away a little bit or still full in yeah well with covid not much yeah travel. right that's true right now but but we hopefully will be getting back to that and uh for decades now we've had our stock footage library as part of our business models so films uh, we license this to other people and we'll continue to do that and, and continue to hopefully continue to travel to capture footage to keep adding to the stock footage library um when we, and, when, and when we started making uh uh secrets of the sea you know, and that's the working title i'm not sure what the film will actually be okay. called but it, it's our first uh digital imax film when we started making that uh the composition for an IMAX film is different than a television film. So the, the footage that I have in my library, some of the footage would work, but the majority of the scenes in my library aren't gonna work. Uh, the IMAX screen is essentially a three by four screen. It's like a, a, you know, the old television format, except the screen is very, very big. It's a hundred feet across and as much as 80 feet high. So if you were to, compose a, a shot, you know, as a close up for television, you'd fill the frame with it. Well, if you do that in IMAX, you can't look at it because it's, it, you know, it extends beyond your peripheral vision. So proper uh, 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 composition in IMAX is to have the subject sort of at the, well, I can't really say, but <laughs> it would be, if you look in this frame here, it'd be right here. Okay. Be below the halfway mark in the frame and at the bottom, and it would, it's kind of a, a bad image for television, you know, because it, it's like he didn't get close and he didn't point the camera at it mm -hmm. right. But for IMAX, you want the, am the animal or the subject to be toward the bottom, pretty much below the halfway mark uh, on the frame. And so since we started making Se Secrets of the Sea, we've been shooting our, our footage, not only for the film, but stock footage in that, with that kind of composition. And, uh, uh, Obviously, the, the scenes and secrets of the sea will be like that. And then our whatever our next film project is, uh, we're already talking about a film that will be made in, in cold water. Uh, we'll have to capture the footage in that in that uh, composition to to make the film. So we're you know our we're we're our stock footage capture uh, program is kind of changing. So we're sort of shifting toward capturing images in IMAX format. Mm -mm. But we've okay. also got this um, idea to make a more of a feature length, an 80 or 90 minute film, pulling footage from our stock footage library. And because Howard has developed such a great um, skill as an editor, and he knows all the footage in the library, obviously, <laughs> because he shot it, um, he's creating, crafting a storyline that will allow us to pull, uh, to utilize footage from over the years of, of uh, footage that's in the library to um, create another film beyond the IMAX. Film. Okay. So definitely keeping busy this time now where you're stuck at the house, I guess you're spending your time in the editing suite. Yeah, maybe yeah. nothing will come of it. But in the meantime, it's keeping him out of trouble by spending <laughs> hours a day in the editing room working on this, this other project. That's good. And I, I think we'll be I think we'll be out doing some local diving again 
real soon. And there's a lot of things that I'm sequences in this, uh, the, the film that I'm making for uh, the feature film, the 90 minute film. Right. Uh, uh, there's a lot of sequences that I need to polish up by going out and doing some additional shooting. So I hope to do that over the next year. And it looks like we'll be able to do some local diving here pretty soon. That's good. So you're not letting any grass grow under your feet. You guys are keeping busy all the time. That's great. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and um, Although my, work, my work ethic is not as, the same as it used to be. So <laughs> I, I was going to do some editing today and I went for a hike instead. <laughs> and uh, I have a question because um, I also uh, work and dive uh, with my wife. I've been a long time. We've been uh, um, uh, managing diving centers uh, for uh, a decade uh, and then uh, now with the underwater tribe together with Mike uh, she's basically the producer of uh, our company here she takes care of all the logistics and all the things that uh, Mike and I really sucks ab <laughs> about you know? now, come on I'm a little better than you <laughs> and uh, one thing though is that uh, I see like um, I mean, you have this great chemistry and I, I can say I have also that with my wife. Okay. And then, uh, Miho, I hope you're listening now because I'm really praising a lot on that. And then one thing is uh, that really always I've been uh, filming or taking picture or I always been doing something underwater. Like even from my early age, uh, I might have going uh, what they call in Australia, cry fishing, you know, back when I started diving like this. And Miko was always there with me. So I was always busy doing things like that. And at the time, she got a little bit bored waiting for me, maybe inside, stuck inside a hole in a cave uh, doing things. What do you do, Michelle, uh, when you go like uh, scouting and maybe let's say Howard is busy on some sequences like that? What, what do you do when underwater? Diving, when, when we're, oh, I'm diving and having a great time just exploring and and i do behind the scenes photos so even now uh yeah. uh by the camera system i'm using now is uh very versatile to go from still phot photos to uh shooting video so i do that as well mm -hmm. but um, what, what camera do you use i have here a picture the, of you with a camera in front of a yeah, third that's or... the that's the current system i have is the sony a6300 and an autocam housing with two small enon uh, uh strobes and uh, I like that system. It's small. It's easier for me to handle than what I used to have. And because it's smaller and easier to handle, I'm now using two strobes, which makes Douglas Seifert very happy because <laughs> when I was using one strobe, he was constantly harping on me. You need to use two strobes. So, OK, now, Douglas, I'm using two strobes. Um, and I, I like that system a lot. It's uh, easy to use compact i actually can get my whole underwater kit in uh, mm -hmm. a small pelican case that i can take on the airplane with me when we travel so i'm set to go um and i'm when he's off very often when we're in the water together and he's shooting something i'm there at his side watching and and helping if i can uh other times I go off to do my own thing and have to be careful that I'm not flashing my strobe when he's yeah. filming. So I either turn the strobe off or go off in another direction or have my back to him. But I'm looking for other things that he might want to film, uh, animal behavior. Uh, so I, it's just all about, you know, it's what we do as divers. We love That's to be in the water fantastic. and observe and watch. And that's beautiful. And I hope, uh, Miho, you listen to this part just there. <laughs> <laughs> but it does take a lot of patience. It does. It does take a lot of patience. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Well, you gave us a lot of really nice uh, uh, behind the scenes shots that you've taken of, of yes. all the, the stuff that looked really quite good. Like we have over here, the, the one with the with the squid. Look yeah, there. humble squid there. Yeah, humble There's squid. Uh, octopus, a giant Pacific octopus. Yeah. So lots of great behind the scenes shots. Cuttlefish. And the, the, the cuttlefish. Uh, you did uh, also film with the IMAX, the cuttlefish during the same time of the Great White or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when, when we go on location, it's, it behooves us to try to have more than one subject for a location. So if we're going to fly all the way to South Australia, Initially, we thought we want to do that for the Great White Sharks, but that's a long way to go. It's an expensive uh, expedition if 
we're only going to be shooting one, capturing one subject. So we thought, what else can we do while we're in South Australia? So we added to that expedition to, uh, to film the um, Australian sea lions and the giant cuttlefish mm. in Wyala. And leafy sea dragons. And leafy sea dragons, and leafy sea yeah. dragons too. So those a lot of we got a lot of good things in South Australia. Mm -hmm. They have also like a, a moment in which uh, there is um, a congregation of uh, the pelagic uh, nudie branch, the the blue ones. I think is in uh, isn't it in South Australia too? Uh, you know the know. blue the yeah, pelagic nudie branch. Yeah, I mean. Like uh, they looks uh, like uh, an angel. Yeah. Not sure. That's uh, something we cool didn't to do. That. Never. <laughs> we uh, didn't comment. <laughs> we must have missed that. Yeah. Send us a memo. We'll I, I, I'll send you. Uh, I've seen it. I think on Facebook, somebody posting like okay. every year, and uh, they got plenty of them. Like, which is really the blue wonderful. angels. Yeah. And um, I actually here is one that really you know the the, the blue whale uh, footage for sure for me is one uh, on top there. And uh, season of our sea is like uh, the the one I fell in love with, and then. But there is a, also in season of our sea, and I see that also here in the 4K sequence, uh, you shoot it again. In the 8K sequence, you shoot it again. Is there is a moment in which you are uh, filming like pelagic jellyfish, like the, the hu looks huge, like this. And I and I wonder how how did you manage this, Howard? Like, did you get sting at all, or were you ever concerned about being in the middle of all these huge jellies? Uh, no, I, I, not really. I, most jellyfish really aren't very venomous. And the, the, the shots you're looking at there, I think you're probably talking about sea nettles, the, the orange ones. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah the, really big ones. They're, they're, they're very large. We see them uh, every year off Monterey, California, uh, and they form huge, dense swarms. Uh, and they will sting if you get them on your cheek or your, yeah. your you know, someplace tender, you, you, you get a little, little bit of a burn, but it's not that big a deal. And of course, in Monterey, the water is quite cold. So we're wearing dry suits and dry gloves and we're pretty, pretty covered up. So it, it's not usually a, a problem. And then when you do get a sting, it's usually right across your, your nose or something like that. And it's mild. Yes, I have a picture here of you like in the middle of uh, this uh, jellyfish uh, and we can see you, you got gloves for protection, but still here is, uh, is exposed. The, the, um, yeah, how many times did you come out with a huge lip after <laughs> shooting a, a sequence like that? Not very often. I was usually pretty careful about swimming face first into one of them. <laughs> I avoid that. Now watch, just watching where you're going. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times you have the tentacles can be very long, so you can't always see them. And occasionally you'll turn and tentacles will, will just, and it really gets you when that tentacle just catches right between your right. regulator and your, your mask. Yeah. But, uh, but like I say, it, it's, it's not a, a very strong sting. It's not very, you know, not really very painful. I have one last question. Go for it. Let's, su let's suppose this scenario, okay? You both are, uh, let's say, on a scouting, and you are in South, uh, in South Africa, okay, to shoot uh, great whites, okay, that are quite active great whites. Howard, you are underwater, and Michelle, you are on the boat. All of a sudden, a big pod of orca, orcas comes over, okay, and we know they are South African orcas that they eat sea lions, you know. Howard, what do you do? They, take the picture. <laughs> take the picture. They're coming in to I mean, suck on the liver of the great whites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you're underwater and you're already there, it's, you're not going to run away from orcas no. or sharks. I mean, they're, they're much too fast. You might as well just turn around and, and film them. Okay. So, but a better question is if you saw orcas coming in or feeding on sea lions, would I jump in the water to film them? All right. That's a that's a different question because then you're actually taking the, the taking the risk. Would you? And it depends on the situation. I think it it depends on water visibility. It depends on a lot of things. But uh, I, I'm I'm not afraid to say no. I I might not because some things when they look stupid, they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And there's a whole bunch of young cameramen out there that would jump in the water without a second thought and ninety. Five percent of the time, they're going to survive. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you know, sometimes it's just not a good idea. So Michelle, how are these underwater? And yeah. is filming this sequence with great whites. And we know that there are yeah. these orcas uh, sucking on their livers there in South Africa, actually or killing so many great whites as a really true apex predator. And you see these orcas coming over. What's your thinking? I'm thinking, I'm hoping that he's smart enough to put the camera between him and the orca and to get a shot. And I'm wondering where the first aid kit is. <laughs> <laughs> the nurse, the nursing background comes back in. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and I I'm, think. And I'm looking around to see if there's another, if there's a doctor on board. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll 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 let you guys go from here. Thank you so much for for spending time with us today, answering questions. It's been a, a, a great insight to to the history and the world that the two of you have been immersed in for for so long. It's been very very entertaining and educational. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's been great fun. Great yeah. reminiscence. Great to see you again after so long. Exactly. And we and hope uh, to see you somewhere soon. Yes. yes after all this so. crisis, we hope to see you here. Yes. Sounds, Thank you. Sounds very good to me. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Well, wow. That was just a super, super wow. Yeah. I mean, incredible interview, incredible insights of, of um, what they do, what they've done, how they organize everything. And, you know, just really open with the information to, to share for everyone. Uh, filming yeah. the logistics so uh, inspirational really, really inspirational. so inspirational and uh, actually you know like i suggest to anyone like today take uh, 52 minutes and go to watch uh, uh, seasons in the sea from 90 the 1990 or 1991 production is on uh, the website of uh, howardhall.com you can find it uh, also in our description and uh, you will have 52 minutes of yeah. uh, oh you know, like incredible, incredible uh, cinematography. Exactly. Right. So before we go, yes, you know, we show a few times that uh, great white shark video, but because we were doing the interview, we kept the volume down. And I think it would be cool to actually have a look at it. Uh, okay. With show the entire actually, video. Yeah. To show the entire the mumble cam, the, mum the, the mumble sound calm. in it to see what the production with the IMAX uh, can if be If there's like. any dentists out there, they're going to have an unfair advantage. They'll be able to understand it a little better. Here we go. Thank 
Incredible, wasn't yeah. it? I think that would uh, definitely get your adrenaline flowing. Can you imagine just being out of the cage with them? I, yeah. I know it's getting more popular now, but back mm -hmm. then it wouldn't have no, been all that no. uh, common. And you can just see the size of them compared to the people in the film. It mm -hmm. just brings it to life where you're like, whoa, I'm not so sure I'd want to do that. Yeah, and in incredible footage. I really like the, the South Australia look, you know, for great whites. Yeah. Every time like, I try to imagine an environment for great whites since I'm a kid, I'm mean, thinking that uh, seagrass, that bottom part, and which is really, really fascinating. I also like how many stingrays. If you look, yeah. you see there's five or six stingrays constantly along the bottom, yeah, big not, not bothered by the sharks at all. Yeah. So really some incredible incredible uh, material that uh, Michelle and Howard have provided us with. Thanks so much uh, yes. to both of you to have made uh, this possible. It was an incredible interview. And, uh, and thank you also. We can see Michelle is busy in the comments today. So thank you guys yeah, for watching with us and too. answering people's questions. Very much appreciated. Yeah. And to all of you guys that uh, have joined this, I hope that you had a, a good time. We're coming up uh, with uh, more and more interviews. So next week, uh, still same time, we're going to be here on Monday, Wednesday and uh, Friday. And then we are still uh, loading up more interviews exactly. also for you. And uh, like today, we're still going to record uh, we'll another a, one. We've got another one recording yes. later today. From 7 to 7, we're going to be in the yep. office. Like, All day long. Uh, 12 hours that keep us busy during this time. And um, hope that uh, I, once again, uh, this uh, show brought you like uh, a, a breath of fresh air. Yeah. That's a nice way Definitely to say. Definitely entertaining, insightful, and uh, just a really, good, uh, a really good show. So While uh, we are a day closer, to the time that we can go back in the water. Yes. I see uh, England today. They just I saw this morning that the people in the UK can now start to mm. go shore diving. So yeah. they're slowly, getting lucky. Slowly, slowly, we're getting back in, in the water, which we are really waiting for. And I will make sure that before I do that, I'm going to go through our website once again <laughs> and Vimeo and everything that I put that in the link in the description, you know, and get some great inspiration and do more uh, natural history. Yeah like a uh, sort of uh, shooting so really really looking for that definitely <laughs> All right, guys, if you enjoyed the show and uh, you would like to support us uh, uh, here in Bali and the diving center that we have uh, and our guys, uh, you can, uh, in the description, there is also a, a link uh, that will allow you to support us uh, with a donation. And also remember that another way that you can use to support uh, us in here is just by sharing this interview here and uh, give us a like too, to the, whether you are on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, that will help us actually to spread it and more people to see it too yeah, so that's exactly. also a great way to contribute and if you want to really go a step further you can write us a, a small review so we have reviews on our page that yes. uh, talks mostly about uh, let's say when we teach photography underwater or when we take you diving out there but now we're bringing this show now for two months maybe you can give us a review on facebook about the show yeah that would help what a lot you think about that yep definitely Okay, so I think uh, that uh, this is That's it. That's it, yep. Yeah. We'll see you next week with Sarah Lewis, Pepe Arcos, and Scott Gatsi Twaisal.
yes another great week coming up have a great weekend all of you and see you on monday bye bye, bye, -bye.